you've been doing whatever job this is for maybe 20 or 30 years. That, most of us wouldn't take that too well. Uh, eventually, it's probably going to come, come to a point where we say, look, this is my company. I'm in charge. I pay the bills. I'm the one that gives the final say so that this company succeeds, you know, that, that because of something I did, and the company fails, it's my fault too. So at some point, it's probably going to come to a head like that, and we can understand that in an earthly sense. We can sometimes forget that Jesus is both God and man. And so here he is in his mortal body, and there he is before people, and constantly they're questioning his authority. And they're questioning, why are you doing this? Why are you saying this? Why are your disciples not doing this? I mean, and they're constantly questioning, questioning, questioning. And mere man in myself, I know what I would be thinking and feeling. That's probably why I'm not, you know, I'm nowhere near the level of God. Thankfully, Jesus is God, and thankfully, he is perfect, because I'm not. Because I know the way I'd be thinking and feeling. I know that my pride would be getting in the way. I know that the little bit of arrogance and a little bit of, you know, just contention would start, and my blood would start boiling. You know, why is this person being so insubordinate? Because that's a word we like to use when people aren't, you know, aren't submitting the way they need to submit. So I can understand on a human side how a normal, regular human would probably have responded, but we're not God. Jesus was God. So here he is. And question after question, insult after insult, that they are casting at him, Jesus has some perfect responses. And over and over and over again, you see those responses uh, in the forms of questions, in the forms of parables, to not only get them to think, uh, but to help them understand uh, the true in importance of what is going on. I want us, you to understand, and I want us to go back to verse 12, or chapter 12. This is the nature of the people. This is the nature of so many of the religious leaders in Mark chapter 12, verse 12, that so many, this is their mindset, and they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them, so they left him and went away. That's what they wanted to do. They wanted to lay hands on here, him, but they feared the multitude. Now you go on down to verse 13, and this is part of our, uh, was our, part of our class last week, but I'm just trying to get up to the text for today. And it says, then they sent uh, to him some of the Pharisees and Herodians to catch him in his words. Uh, when they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and care, um, and care about no one, for you, you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And so here they say, we've come to, to catch him in his words. We want to catch him. That's what they keep trying to do. Because now the religious leaders, what they want to happen is they want to turn the crowd on Jesus. They want to say, say something that's going to trip him up so that not only the religious leaders are against him, but the entire crowd is. And as we, as we talked about previously, they talked in, in regard of paying taxes, uh, as we already know. Uh, shall, we pay, shall we pay or shall we not pay? Uh, but he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a Daenerys that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, uh, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The, the first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. The second took her, he died, no, uh, nor did he have any, uh, leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, uh, uh, when the, they, are, they rise, whose wife will, will she be? For all seven had her as wife. And Jesus answered and said to them, 
Are you not therefore mistake, uh, mistaken because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead uh, that, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage uh, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You therefore, you therefore, you are therefore greatly mistaken. And so here in Mark chapter 12, you're seeing so many times over and over again that they're just trying to get him caught on something, you know, caught on taxes, caught on, you know, whose wife is this going to be in the resurrection? They, they want something that he trips up on. Now, I want us to make applications for this today. If we are out in the world today and we're proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ as we are supposed to be, are we going to sometime in our life probably face naysayers just like this? Well, probably are. If we're speaking up the way we need to be speaking up for the truth and for the cause of Christ, probably eventually somebody's going to ask us a question like this, and probably a lot of you in here already have been asked questions like this. Take, for instance, you're in a Bible study with someone, uh, and you know that you disagree on salvation. And so, but they have learned a tactic, a tactic with one specific verse, uh, excluding every other verse, and they've learned this tactic, and they have mastered it. They have mastered how to use and how to twist and how to just abuse one word in Scripture and taking it completely out of context, and they want to use that same argument every single time you ever bring up salvation. Has it happened to anybody else besides myself? I, I believe it has. Because the world is not just living in worldliness. World, the world is also coming at the church. And so you have people in this world, they are preparing to try to take down arguments. That is another reason why we need to be thoroughly equipped in the Word of God, to be able to stand up to the test, to be able to teach the truth. Now, are you going to persuade everybody? No, I'm not going to persuade everybody. But the reality is we need to know what the truth stands and stand on that truth. And so here Jesus stood on the truth. He stood very hard and very powerful. And I know he's the Son of God. I get that. But we're children of God now too. And we can stand on the same word that he stood on. No, we're not perfect. No, we have flaws, and sometimes we do forget things. But we can go back to the word, and we can show them what the word says and stand on the truth of uh, Jesus and his word. And so I want us to remember that, that like Jesus, as we go into the world, we're going to face people like this sometimes. It's going to happen. And I'll, I'll go a little step further. If this never happens to you in your life, I'm not saying this is going to happen every day, but if it never happens in your life, if in the course of your entire living, say you live 70 years, you know, in the course of 70 years of living, if you never have anyone question why you do what you do and what you believe or anything of the sort, then maybe each of us needs to do a heart check and see if we're truly living out the Christian life that we're supposed to be living out. Because when you read in Scripture, every time they turned around when they were living for Christ, they were getting questioned by somebody. Their accusations were getting brought against by somebody. You know, there was something going on in it that was also negative, and you can talk about, there are only three instances, by the way, in Scripture that the word Christian is men mentioned. And in one of those, uh, it talks about how Christians are going to suffer uh, so you talk about that, you look at what we are as Christians, we're going, we're going to suffer. Uh, even in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're going to suffer for righteousness' sake. So that's something that we as Christians can, can understand that it's going to be part of our life. If we're not, you might want to check and see if we're living for God the way we're supposed to be. Because uh, maybe, maybe it's possible that we're just not standing up for the truth. So I want us to keep that into mind as we go into this next part, because I felt like the heart check was going to be really important as we dive into this next question, as we dive into this next accusation and this next insult that they're going to throw at Jesus. 
Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, going through verse 34. Then one of the scribes came, having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And I want to pause there because he's indicating, you know, Jesus has done a very good job. He has answered them very well. And, and they're, they, in, in kind of a, an unexpected kind of way, they're, they're complimenting him. They're like, well, he, no, he's, he's done an exceptional job at this. We have to do better. And so they're going to try harder. And so they're going to they're gonna throw something out here uh, that, that is, they hope to be very challenging. Which is the first commandment of all? Now let's see how Jesus responds. Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You should love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no one uh, no other but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love one neighbor as oneself is more than, uh, than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So here's a questioning that they are going to attack him at the very core, at the very base of what is the greatest law. Now, you can understand what's going to happen if, if a man messes this up. Now, Jesus is not going to mess this up. But what they're hoping is he's going to make a mistake. What they're hoping is that he's going to say something like, he, like was indicated in the latter part of this verse, that where the sacrifices, where those are, those are more important. Or maybe, maybe they're going to say, well, you know, that the Sabbath was more important or the keeping of certain things was what individually was more important. Or, and they're hoping that he makes a mistake here. But the Lord doesn't make mistakes. So here he gives the most confident and most bold answer about the greatest commandment. Now I want you to notice this from, from our notes. The rabbis had counted in over 365 negative commandments uh, and 248 positive ones. That's a total of 613 commandments approximately, all right, of commandments that they have counted. So they're hoping that he just picks one out of here and just, you know, just one random one that they can attack and pounce on and, and try to ha create an argument. Jesus had already answered this question back over in Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28, and he had already given indication of what the most important thing really, truly was. And really, when you look at his answer, he's really, he's going back to the law, and especially the, uh, there in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 and verse 5, and also there in Leviticus 19, verse 18, you see he goes back to when the law had been given the first time, and even the second recording there in Deuteronomy, who they even indicated what it meant to serve God and what the whole of the law was really all about. When you look there at the commandments uh, in Deuteronomy 6.5, Deuteronomy 6.5 covers uh, basically the first four of the Ten Commandments, and Leviticus 19 verse 18 covers really the last six of the Ten Commandments. And so what you have is that in all of these scriptures, you see what it really means, what it boils down to. And that's what Jesus boiled it down to. He boiled it down to what it really means uh, to be a servant of God, to, as Ecclesiastes says, you know, fear God and keep his commandments. Here, they submit to the fact that God is one, that he is the one, that he is the only and then he goes on and says, not only is he one, but you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He says that is the first commandment. Notice that as he goes through this text, giving the first and then the, the second, there of loving your neighbor as yourself, Notice that at the end of this, all of this reading and all this text that we have, these sayings of Jesus, that it says they didn't have the courage to ask him any, anything further. 
So that's what the word of God does. The word of God will hush and will silence ultimately anything that rises up against it. Now that doesn't mean it's going to quit in this lifetime because there's always going to be people that hate the word of God. There's always going to be people trying to contradict the word of God. And there's always going to be people trying to challenge what we believe. But notice that when the word of God is spoken accurately, that the word of God stands because it is his and it belongs to him. It is the very definition of what truth truly is. Now notice this about this lawyer. This one talking to him seems to be fairly sincere in his question because when he gives a response back here, you have that he's in agreement. You know, you've said very wisely. Once again, they're complimenting him for the way that he has given this answer. But I want to dive a little bit deeper into this answer because basically, greatest command, love the Lord your God. Love this one God that we talk about. We talk about that in Ephesians chapter 4. Love this one God with, all your, with your all. With your minds, your hearts, your strength, your soul. Love him with everything you got. So let's dive into this a little bit um, this morning. Loving God with our all, as we said, includes the heart, which some have described as the seat of emotion. The soul, the seat of life, and the mind, the seat of our intellect. The street, the seat of our energy. To love God here in this greatest commandment is going to tell a lot of things. As we said, it, it does talk about loving God with all of our minds. And this can include things like studying the Word of God. We're going to love God with all of our mind. So what does that mean? Well, it can mean a lot of things. It can mean what kind of things are we put into our mind. Are we putting the Word of God in or are we putting worldliness in? Are we putting the things uh, that are of the flesh or things of the Spirit? What kind of things are we putting into our mind? What kind of thoughts are we allowing to uh, live and dwell in our minds, and are we letting them influence the way that we think about things and do things? Do we have a spiritual mindset, or are we still have an earthly and a fleshly mindset? So when we look there in passages such as, such as over in Timothy uh, and in Philippians and Romans, we get the idea that we as people are to have a different kind of mind. That we are to have a mind that uh, is, has been transformed in God, have a mind that is focused on his word, have a mind that is living for him in such a pure and noble way. We are to be people that are uh, studying the word of God. We are to be people that are putting the word of God into our hearts. We are to be people that are, are taking that word of God and using it to be equipped. You think about uh, there in the, the closing chapters of 2 Timothy, uh, you have in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, you talk, talk about the, the inspiration of Scripture, and then you go right on from that, you go into chapter 4 and tell you to preach the Word. The Word of God, the inspired Word of God, is to be something that is on our minds continually. It's to be something that we have put in our mind and that we have knowledge, that we have understanding, that we are making these decisions not based on feelings and emotions, but based on what we know to be true, what is truth, what is fact. The reality is we want to love God with all of our mind, with all of our intellect, with all of our ability to know, to understand, to comprehend with that which is true. We're going to love God in this way. Not only... We're going to take that knowledge into our brains and into our minds, but it's going to impact our lives. It's going to impact the way we think about things, which therefore is going to impact the things that we do. Because if we don't think about them first differently, then we're not going to do things differently. So we have to first think differently, and then we will do differently. And so when you come to like Philippians 4.8, where it's talking about a different way of thinking, we have to think that way. We have to think that pure, uh, you know, Pureness of mind. 
and have that live out every single day of our life. We have to be those living sacrifices, Romans chapter 12 and verses one and two. We have to be that kind of person day in and day out because we have made a conscious decision in our minds that that is the way we're going to live. And it's gonna impact our decisions. It's gonna impact the places we go. It's gonna impact you know, the, the people we associate with and the kind of things we participate in. Because if you go on down to verse two of Romans chapter 12, what you're gonna see is that we are to have a transformed mind. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to the, everything this world has to offer. But our minds are to be transformed. Our minds are to be transformed in him. And it's with those transformed minds we are to love God with our all. We're to love God with all of our hearts. When I think about hearts, I think about John chapter 14, verse 15. Thinking about you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. The reality is, is that we should love God. Notice this, love's a choice though. So here you have the heart and mind coming together. The heart and mind really uh, in the human body are really one. But you have the heart and the mind, the, the knowledge, the facts, the understanding. And with all of that comes the heart because we love God for what he has done. We love God what he continues to do. And we love God for what he's going to do in the future. We love God in his entirety. And therefore, we are going to keep his commandments because the other alternative is to be cast into hell forever. And so here, I'm going to love God with my all. So what am I going to love? Recently, we had a sermon talking about uh, faith-fueled emotions. And we talked about the fact that our faith should fuel some very godly emotions that as we live out a faithful life, that I'm going to stand before the Lord in awe, and I'm going to stand before the Lord in his presence and be just awestruck of how great and wonderful he is. I'm going to express my love to him. I'm going to pour my heart out to him. I'm going to do so today in worship. I'm going to do so in my private prayers. I'm going to do so in everything that I do day in and day out. I'm going to stand in awe of God, and I'm going to pour out from my heart as we all should the love that I have for him because I love God with my all. I think sometimes the way we live, we barely even show a like for God. We barely even show God to be an acquaintance. Sometimes we frequently his word so seldom that we forget who God is. And we forget who God is, it's easy for our minds to just wander away and forget that he was our first love. Forget that he's our creator, forget that he's our sustainer, forget that he's the provider of salvation, forget that he's the one that is preparing that eternal home for us to live in forever. And therefore we leave that first love and we go off into the ways of the world and we go back to the world uh, and we live for those things again. We are to love God with all of our minds and with all of our hearts. And that's going to mean us being willing to give things up. You know, we talked about suffering as a Christian. And I think sometimes we confuse this a little bit. We say, yes, I'm suffering. I'm suffering. I couldn't go to the, to the bar Friday night. I'm suffering. Suffering because I, I couldn't go and uh, I couldn't go and take in certain activities. I'm suffering. I think that's what a lot of people think about when they think about suffering. Oh, I can't do all the worldly sinful things that I want to do, so I'm suffering. No, we're suffering for doing good, not suffering for not doing evil. Yeah, I don't. We shouldn't be participating in those things. Yes, we have to lay down all selfish desire. That's true, but. The suffering of the Christian, we're, we're going deeper than that. It's not just not getting to do these things. We're going to suffer for doing what is right. So our suffering is not just going to be, okay, well, I, I don't get allowed to do this. I can't have everything that I want. No, we're going to be stronger than that. It's not just not getting to do what I want. 
So I'm going to suffer for doing the things that I know God, my God has called me to do. What kind of things are we going to be willing to give up? What kind of things are we going to count as valuable? You look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. No, where's your treasure? What do you treasure? You treasure this life? You treasure, you know, the flesh and the blood? You treasure the spirit and things of heaven. I heard people talk about one time a story of a man that he, um, and this, was just a, this was just a story, so understand that, that he, he died and it was time for judgment. And he gets, he gets there to the gates and uh, they said, well, you know, there's something special going on today. Today you get to take one day and you're going to travel down this elevator and take the elevator down. It's going to take you, take you down to hell. And you're going to spend one day there. And after one day there, you get to come back and you get to choose uh, which place you want to go. And God looked at him and said, okay, that don't sound too good, but okay. And so he gets on the elevator, he goes down, and he gets down to, to hell. And then when he gets down there, he recognizes that, wow, they got they got white sandy beaches. And they got, they got all the golf courses I could ever imagine. And they got all the rich, fancy foods and everything that I've ever wanted. They have entertainment that, it, that no world has ever seen this, this great. And so he spends a day in what he thinks is luxury. And then he digs over, he gets back on the elevator, he rides back up, and they said, okay, what, what's your choice? He says, wow. I don't know. That all seems so great. That seems so wonderful. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I'm going to choose hell. So he hops back on the elevator and he, he gets off and I kind of forget the conclusion of this, but uh, it was something like, well, that was just our foyer uh, because he realizes now that he truly is in torment and all of the gnashing of teeth and all the hellfire that he didn't see before, that's, where, that's what he's experiencing now. See, I think so many of us, at times, we say we're going to love God. We say we're going to love God with our, all of our all. But sometimes we for, forget to give God our whole mind. And sometimes we forget to give him our whole heart. And sometimes it's not just us forgetting to give God our mind and our heart. We make an active choice not to. What do we treasure? Matthew chapter 6, 21. What if we gain the whole world? What, what if? I mean, I, I recently saw that someone won, like, what was it, $1.28 billion in a lottery somewhere? I forget where it was. $1.28 billion. I think I saw after taxes or something like that, they're going to have somewhere around $470 million or something like that after taxes. Wow, that's a lot of money. In fact, I could, well, there's not 470 people. We could all split a million dollars every, every which way, and everybody in here would be happy, at least worldly happy. Is that the kind of gain we're looking for? We're looking for financial gain through something like that's as corrupt and evil as the lottery? Or are we looking for something that's far, more, far better, something that's spiritual, something that's going to give us that home in heaven? Our soul is too valuable to not love God with all of our heart. We need to be willing to do anything for God and have those faith-fueled emotions that pour out from our hearts and from our minds day in and day out as we love him. We need to love God with all of our strength. Uh, love is going to be expressed. Uh, Christianity is a doing religion, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. We see that faith without works is dead. We're going to be, a, we're going to be doers of the word, not hearers only. We're going to be people that are taking the word of God that we've heard, and we're going to do something with it. And with that, we're going to need great strength. We're going to need fortitude. We're going to need energy. We're going to need power. And all of that is supplied by Jesus Christ. Do we love God with every ounce of energy that we have, every ounce of energy that is in our minds, that is in our souls, uh, that is in our character? Does our character have the strength? Does our minds have the strength? Does our pure hearts have the strength? Does our entire self have the strength? 
to love God with our all, to love him with our soul, here meaning life. Some verses in the Bible that translate uh, psyche to, uh, to life, Matthew 6, 25, John 15, 13, uh, but Matthew 20, verse uh, 27, 28, uh, the psyche uh, means life within man. This means to love God with all, with all one has, all one is, and all one can be. We give all to him, our heart, our body, and our soul. We're going to love God with all of our soul, with all that we are, with the life that's in us. You know, when the, when the body gives up the spirit, when the body gives up the life, we're left with the outer shell. When my grandmother died, actually both my grandmothers died, they weren't the same person anymore. Yeah, their body was there. But that spirit that was within them, that wasn't there anymore. You can tell. You can tell by just looking at them. That the, are we going to love God with all that we are? Not talking about our fleshly bodies. But all that we are inside. Are we going to do that? That is something that should bring us to our knees before the Almighty God. Now thinking about this, Jesus has been questioned over and over and over again. And so now, he's going to have some questions. And I think I would too. I think I'd have some questions. But, you know, if, uh, as we said before at the beginning of class, if, if my authority is challenged over and over and over again, eventually as, as a human, I'm probably going to get upset. Jesus is not necessarily, you know, as we see, physically upset, but he's going to make some very uh, direct questions uh, towards these people uh, to help them start thinking about things that were far better. Matthew chapter 22, verses 41 through 46. And when the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How then does David in the Spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then called... Sorry, I kicked something. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. You see here that the questions that Jesus asks, and really even the statements that Jesus makes towards these people, it shuts down their arguments. It doesn't win over every heart. It doesn't win over every mind that not everyone is going to come to believe in him, and you can see that through his crucifixion. But he's going to shut down their arguments, and he's going to ask this question, whose son is the Christ? This sounds like an easy enough question. Most all Jewish scholars believe that the Messiah uh, would be a descendant of King David. The son of David, this answer, uh, is, is, a, is correct, but it is incomplete Um, because he goes on and says then how does David in the spirit call him Lord saying the Lord said to my Lord sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet and then coming from the Psalms Psalm 110 verse 1 which most all Jews knew to be a promise of the Messiah that Jesus was foretold from since the beginning since the fall of man, you know, Genesis 3.15, uh, since, since mankind has been hearing about there's a Messiah coming, there's one coming, there's the seed that's coming, there's all these things are coming. The, the Messiah, the entire Old Testament, we're doing an Old Testament survey on Wednesday night with, our, with the young people. The entire Old Testament is pointing right towards Christ. They've known for nearly forever that the Messiah was coming. And so he asked them these questions to really get them to think, to really get them to understand. The first Lord is God, the Father. The second Lord, as believed by the Jews, is the Messiah. If David then calls him Lord, how is he the son? The Christ is the son of David, but he is far more than that. And that's what he wants them to understand. He wants them to understand that, yes, technically speaking, in, in a 
uh, you know, a family tree fashion, Jesus is a descendant of David. Really, if you look at the, the genealogy, he's really descendant, the, no matter which earthly parent you track him through. Uh, but as you, as you look at this, Jesus is far more than just a descendant of David. Now notice this too about the house of David. While in David's life and even in Solomon's life, uh, the household of David were, were kings. They were earthly kings. But you're going to get down to a point where that house, where that is no longer allowed to be king anymore. That they're not going to be able to reign and rule as the way that they had done previously. To say that he is the Christ, to say that he is the Messiah, has far, far more implications than him just being David's descendant. Yeah, he was David's descendant, all right. But he's the son of God. He needed him to see both the physical and the spiritual. And that's what we need to see about our God, too. There's a physical side of things, yes. Jesus came in the flesh. There's a spiritual side of things that we need to know that is far, far better. That what he does here, yes, he, he, he hushes their questions. But he says something that is so profound that he, he really needs them to understand and comprehend. To comprehend who he is. It wasn't, yes, it was important for the lineage for the sake of prophecy and fulfillment of who God is and all those things, that's very important. But he is the Christ, the Messiah. And even those that did not know or even care about, you know, the Gentiles, nations that came to Christ, they didn't have as much stock necessarily in whose family did he come from, even though it's very important. He was the Messiah. Yes, he fulfilled our prophecy. He is God. God. So it both are very truly important. You can't separate the two. They're both important. But he needed them to see both. Yes, he's of the right house. But yes, he is the Messiah. And that is something that we need to understand. To answer Jesus would have meant admitting to, that their understanding and teaching about the Messiah was incomplete. Um, notice this. You look there in um, Mark chapter 12, verse 30. Uh, 37, and the latter part of that, you see that this is going to delight the, the large crowd. The, the crowd still has not turned away from Jesus. And we need to understand that. We need to kind of let that sink in and understand that Jesus did a very, very good job of answering questions. And he did a very good job of asking his own questions. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. You have the genealogies, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 6, Luke chapter 3, verse 31. Uh, he is also David's Lord. Uh, he predates David. Uh, he's David's creator. Years later, Jesus would tell John, I am the root and the descendant of David. The root is what things grow from, but the descendant is what comes after. A root is the starting point of a plant, and the descendant is the fruit of a plant that comes later. Yes, Jesus is the son of God, but the Pharisees understood the Messiah was of the son of David royalty, they needed to understand that the Messiah was the son of God deity. They needed to understand that he truly was the son of God. And what a great question to ask the people and what a great, great question for all of us to consider today ourselves. Do we see that Christ is not only the son of David, but he is truly the foretold, the living, the present, the almighty God, our Savior. He's truly the Christ, the Messiah. And if we see that, and we understand that, if we haven't put on Christ in baptism, what changes are we ready to make? And if we have, we won't say just what, what changes are we ready to make, are we going to love God with our all? Heart, soul, mind, strength. Are we going to give him our all? Because if we do that, I can guarantee it's going to change our lives. 
And even more than that, it's going to change lives of those around us. That as those see the light that we're walking in, that we're living by, that some, too, will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So the challenge for all of us today is to love God with our all and to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Any questions, comments today as we close? All right, we're dismissed.